Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. I'm Bill Drees, reporter for The Daily Memphian. We are talking with Dr. Earl Fisher of Up the Vote 901, the People's Convention, and pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church. This is On the Record. We record this Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023, the start of an election year that features a special election later this month for the vacant state house seat representing District 86. As you are hearing this, early voting is underway as of Wednesday, January 4th, and runs through January 19th. Election day is January 24th for the 45,000 or so voters in the district that is made up of Millington, Northern Shelby County, North Memphis, Downtown, and Southwest Memphis. But we're here specifically to talk about the only regularly scheduled elections in this election year, the city of Memphis elections and the mayor's race on that ballot in particular. The total ballot also includes races for all 13 council seats as well as city court clerk. These are all nonpartisan races, no primaries. An attempt by some on the Memphis City Council last year to change that city charter requirement and allow for partisan primaries failed. So did a move to a runoff provision that should no candidate in the race for mayor get a majority of the votes cast, this would go to a runoff. Again, that move also failed. Dr. Fisher, in your capacity as one of the co-founders of the People's Convention gatherings that started in 2019, You have recently called for a new People's Convention this year to act, as I understand it, as a sort of de facto mayoral primary. Is that correct? Well, first, Brother Bill, thank you for having me again. It's always good to be with you and Happy New Year to you and all of your listeners. Yeah, I think you've pegged it pretty well. I think you've set the landscape, which we tried to articulate when we announced that we were putting together the planning committee uh, late 2022 and Then we uh, put a video together earlier this week. So, yeah, I think when you are in a situation where you understand the likelihood of misrepresentation through the splitting or the diminishing of the vote of the majority of the citizens and you are in a context where you don't have the luxury of even requiring the majority of the people who vote in an election to set the stage for who's going to be in arguably the most powerful office in the land. We want to try to build upon what we relaunched in 2019. I know you said we like started it, but of course we are building upon what was done in 1991. Although the political landscape is different as far as nuances are concerned and representation and numbers and things of that nature. And although in 2019, we helped to, I think, set the agenda And so far as what people have been talking about from the mayor's office and city council and uh, other offices around the city, I think we've learned a lot from what we've been through. And now we're here to try to uh, do what regretfully there, there is not a party in place to do right now. The Democratic Party is not trying to put together a, a primary of sorts. And so, you know, we have to do something to try to find a consensus candidate. We don't know how much of an impact this will have. We know it will have some, and we hope that it has maximum impact. So thank you for letting us talk about it. All right. And and let's talk about 1991, because the People's Convention that was a factor in Willie Harrington becoming the city's first elected Black mayor came with the candidates participating in that process, pledging that they would get out of the mayor's race if they were not the convention's choice. Will that be a condition of of the gathering that you're working on at this point for this year? So I can say on behalf of Up to Vote 901 and our community partners that it is an aspiration. I can also say in the spirit of full disclosure Those candidates that we've been in conversation with, and several of them have been part of our gatherings up to this point, as we announced in our video, um, this is something that we're still discussing. We have not, you know, put the ink is not dry on the particulars of the process, and therefore we cannot say with confidence exactly what the requirements 
will be. But we do know we want to do what we can to try to ensure that you don't have six, you know, African-American candidates running in the mayoral election and then one Caucasian candidate running. And so hopefully we can reach a point with all of the candidates who are going to be a part of this where we can all agree on what the best path forward is and definitely having people withdraw and support a consensus candidate is on the table. We have quite the crowd of of contenders who have declared or have said they are thinking about the mayor's race this year. Uh, we should point out that nobody can pull a qualifying petition to get on the ballot until this coming May. Uh, w- with that said, do you have a date that you have set for this gathering at this point? No, we haven't had the date set yet. And I think what you have described is part and parcel of why this makes our task so complicated. Um, If you are having a election in the fall and people can pull a petition all the way up through the summer, you know, knowing that you have to try to build momentum to engage and educate and empower voters and then knowing that it is centered to some degree on which candidates are going to be a, a participant in these things. It makes it complicated for us because you have to wait until May to know who is officially on. But there are people who have you know, been unapologetic about their announcement insofar as their intent is concerned. We've been in conversation with a lot of them. Some of them have been a part of our planning up to this point. We're reaching out to others. We want every candidate who is serious about running to know that we are welcoming them to participate in this planning process. And, you know, for those who uh, take us up on the offer, then kudos to them. And, you know, they can help shape, you know, when and where and how. And for those who choose to to not participate, I think that there's, that's their prerogative. But I also think it signifies a lack of commitment to ensuring that we have a consensus candidate or that the black vote is not diminished. And so I am going to start, you know, articulating much more aggressive skepticism in that regard over the next several months. So so what have you heard by way of feedback from the mayoral contenders that that you've talked with so far? Are they buying into this? I think some of them are, you know, at least a handful of them. We'll reveal the names of those who we've been talking to um, over the next few weeks. We're, again, trying to provide some reasonable opportunity for those who have not participated even though some of them have been asked and have declined, some of them we just simply had not been in direct contact with yet. And so, you know, we want we don't want to try to taint the jury pool. We're not trying to, um, you know, discolor anybody's campaign up to this point. But those who have participated, uh, what we generally agree on is that right now it's too early to tell people to try to withdraw. You know, and I think there are other things that have to be put on the table to ensure that the People's Convention is fair and equitable insofar as how it is produced and conducted. And so I'm glad to know that people are interested in the idea. People are sincere in trying to make sure that uh, whoever is the mayor in the city of Memphis in 2023 and for the next several years is somebody who has articulated a unapologetic commitment to ensuring some of the basic necessities for the most vulnerable citizens in the city. And so beyond that, I mean, we haven't gotten into a lot of the weeds yet. It's just preliminary conversation, which is why we have this open invitation for people to participate in the planning committee. All right. As we noted at at the top of this, uh, the city charter says that uh, city elections are to be nonpartisan, that there will not be party primaries for that. Do you, do you think that city elections are a matter of Democrats versus Republicans right now, even though there aren't any primaries? So, no, I don't think that. I think um, what we've seen historically over the last several election cycles is ultimately someone who is going to identify as a Democrat is going to win. Uh, in one form or another. <laughs> and by that, I know un- I understand certain people are Democrats in name only, but you can't win a election in the city of Memphis, a citywide election, without banking the majority of the votes from black people, because the majority of the electorate is black and the majority of the electorate identifies as Democratic. And I just want to say, you know, with all due respect to the Shelby County Democratic Party, it's frustrating when you don't have the type of courageous and visionary leadership that would find a way to ensure that the Democratic vote is not split. If you look around the country, Brother Bill, even when you see some of these cities and counties that are nonpartisan, you don't see majority white 
cities suffer from some minority candidate, some African-American candidate who sneaks in the back door with, you know, a minority number of the votes. That just doesn't seem to happen. And so it's disappointing that we don't have, you know, more people who uh, are stepping up to the plate to try to ensure that this does not happen. What, what it seems to be is, you know, a few people in a, in, in a few places trying to figure out how to best manipulate the landscape as it is. But yes, I think even though the city council was unable to pass partisan elections, which is something that I think is necessary. And I know there's still conversation about what it means to go to 13 single member districts for the city council and things of that nature. At the end of the day, what everybody should be committed to is trying to ensure sure that the people who are elected into office adequately represent the will of the majority of their constituents. And I think when you don't have partisan elections in place and in a context like we are in right now in the city of Memphis, and we see the contrast between the city elections and the county elections because county elections are partisan, I, I feel like we still suffer from a lack of rep representation. And hopefully the Memphis People's Convention in 2023, as it sought to do in 20. 19 and as it did in 1991 will have something to say about adequate representation speaking of the county at as you know county elections do not have runoffs for any positions though so so what do you think that that says uh, because you're you're kind of holding up the county elections as an example because they're partisan yet mm -hmm. they they do this without a runoff Yes. And so I'm not holding up partisan elections as if they are perfect. <laughs> I am holding them up as if I believe they are more progressive insofar as adequate representation is concerned. I could be wrong about this, Brother Bill, but I do think county elections require you to win a majority of the vote. If I'm wrong about that, then I don't mind being corrected. But what I will also say is this. In the county seats that I'm familiar with, there hasn't been elections that have been so close that you have even needed a runoff in recent memory. And I think that's because partisan elections and primaries do their part. And so since the city election does not have primary elections such that parties can do their part, now you have to have people like myself and our community partners and up to vote come together and try to pick up the pieces. Which was one of the discussions that, that, that the city council had because the thinking was, okay, if if the council cannot get enough votes to put a ballot question to change the charter and the, if the voters approve, allow for primaries, then the next option was, OK, well, let's bring back the runoff requirement then. So, so it seemed to be an either or discussion that that this if we can't go for this remedy, let's go for this remedy then. Well, I think the irony of this bill, when we think about it, and you and I have had conversations about this over the last few years. You know, instant runoff voting would have solved a lot of this, you know, and um, again, you are dealing with a political landscape that is not adequately responding to the voice of the majority of the citizens, because the majority of the citizens in Memphis, when it was put on the ballot, have voted for instant runoff voting several times. So this is a case of what can we get done at the very least? It's almost like a race to the bottom, regretfully, because what we would want is the majority of the people who participate in an election would have you would you would want 50 plus one. I don't I don't see a adequate argument against it. You would want partisan elections like can you imagine what a national election would look like if there were no political parties? And I'm not uh, uh, caping for either party as if they are some um infallible entity that adequately represents even the people it claims to represent, but they are helpful in so far as organizing the consciousness, the political consciousness of a group of people. And so you would want partisan elections. You would want people to have to identify and be held accountable to a particular group that has vetted them. And I know people might want to say you vet people at the ballot box, but that would be if you had a large constituency within a city or a county or a country that you know was politically astute and enlightened. And the fact is, because of the way the political landscape has been, because of so much you know, money in politics that has been unchecked and unbridled, because of so much political manipulation and exploitation, that's not the case. So what can we have? You know, right now, it seems like the only thing we can have at the city level is a people's convention and then hopefully build enough momentum to enlighten and engage and empower enough voters to make the best decision and then try to challenge the candidates to be more open and honest and be held accountable. 
Do, do you think that candidates more often get into a race in order to be a spoiler, quote unquote, or do you think that this is a problem where people get into a race not not thinking that they're going to split the vote, but thinking that they're the best candidate? I don't want to engage in too much speculation. Here's what I'd say about the conversation we've had with the candidates who have been a part of our process up to this point. I think all of them feel like they are viable candidates and would serve well in the office. And I think that's reasonable. I think people should have that level of self-confidence, especially if they have a significant track record. Those who we have been in conversation with do have decent track records and I think might be able to serve well. But outside of that, you know us, Bill, we don't really focus so much on individuals as we focus on um, ideas and we don't focus as much on personality as we focus on on policy. So it's about issues and not individuals and policies and not personalities for us. So I don't need to speculate too much about why people would get in a race or whether someone is set up from a conspiratorial standpoint as a spoiler. I don't really care about that because they should not be able to spoil an election if you have a adequately engaged, informed and empowered electorate. So that's what we're after. That's what we believe the People's Convention can provide. And so we're more committed to investing in that than we are to try to speculate or interrogate people's motives on why they're right. All right. That this past fall, the Shelby County Young Democrats had a really important early forum for the mayoral contenders. Three were there. Uh, former Shelby County Commissioner Van Turner, who is also president of the Memphis branch NAACP. Uh, Paul Young, who is uh, downtown Memphis Commission president. Uh, and Joe Brown, retired criminal court judge. And each of the three told that gathering downtown that if it looked like they couldn't win, that there was no mathematical possibility that each of them said that they wouldn't have a problem with getting out of the race at the point that they realized that. It, is that encouraging or it is a candidate realizing they can't win uh, kind of an elusive uh, plateau for this? So I think this is a wonderful question. I think this is a wonderful reference point. And I believe that if a candidate is left to his or her own vices, then their illusions or their assessments of their viability can be inflicted upon the people. So it's one thing to ask them those questions, and those are valuable questions. And I think all of their responses are worth, you know, uh, reviewing and, and, and trying to decipher about the, the authenticity of it. Having said that, I think what's more important is making sure that there is an entity that can enforce something like that, like primaries would do, <laughs> you know, whether mm -hmm. or not a candidate felt personally that they were the best candidate. If you are part of a party and there's a primary process, regardless of your individual impulse, you are held accountable to the larger unction of the party. And so at this point, we have to try to make sure we build the partnership network of Up the Vote 901. And we've mentioned, you know, several of the partners who have been part of this process with us up to this point from Memphis Artists for Change and the official Black Lives Matter Memphis chapter, Sister Reach, Stand for Children and Micah. You know, and I know there's others that we we will be in contact with and conversation with. It's more about us being able to gather together and organize a group of people with fair and equitable and proportionate representation to ensure that even if a person individually felt like they would be the best candidate, if they aren't able to corral themselves or corral this group around that consensus through a legitimate and objective process, then I don't think it really matters if they make that claim in public or not. It's about what we can hold them to. All right. A, a final point. You did council races at the 2019 People's Convention. You heard from from council candidates and, um, and and announced endorsements in some of those races. Will that be the case with this gathering? My my hunch is that, yes, that will be the case. Again, as part of this planning process, a lot of the ink is not dry. But of course, we want to make as much of a significant impact as we can. And because the council races are under the same rules and regulations of the mayoral race, you still run the risk at the council level of people walking in through the back door and not having the majority of the 
uh, citizens and the constituents and the voters vote them into office. So we are not even necessarily sure of the format. You know, in 2019, we did one day. Uh, in hindsight, we realized it was a little bit too long. You know, I think we were there for like four or five hours and things of that nature. And so it might be best now for us to consider doing a couple different days, you know, and maybe you do a city council seat or two or three one day and then do the mayoral race on another day or something like that. And then there's other things that we're thinking about over the next few months that people will hear about in terms of uh, giving people more exposure and leading up to uh, whenever we do have the convention, which will probably be somewhere, you know, between May and November, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so, so I, I, so I think that that's on the table. And if you push me to the wall, I'll say, yes, we'll do it today, but uh, we haven't made that decision as a group yet. All right. And and we should point out that the city council at this point has an ad hoc redistricting group, which is taking another look at the district lines uh, for those council seats and whether those district lines should be changed, whether even the structure of the city council should be changed as a result of this second look at district lines. So more to come. Uh, we may not have as many elections as we had in 2022, but 2023 certainly promises to be a busy political and election year in the city of Memphis. We've been talking with Dr. Earl Fisher of the People's Convention and Up the Vote 901, as well as the pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church. I'm Bill Drees, and this has been On the Record. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.